We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Dr. Kerry Bowley. He has worked as a senior lecturer at the University of South Wales, also a mental performance coach, and has worked with the Welsh FA, and recently has taken a new position as head of coaching support with the City Football Group. Too many qualifications to name alongside that one if we want to get this done in under an hour. So phenomenal insight into coaching theory and practice, how to take it on the grass. We talk about observation and delivery, two very, very important but often overlooked aspects of coaching, especially when it comes to self-review, reflection, awareness and all those things. Before we begin, a quick reminder to our listeners to set aside five or ten minutes today Get online and check out Sports Lab 360. We're excited about the work they are doing to help educate and develop players from a soccer IQ perspective. More to come at the halfway point with an exclusive MSC podcast offer. Here's Kerry. Enjoy. Kerry, thank you so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Excited to have you on. Thank you. We're going to talk about observing and talk about something that's so simplistic, but then whenever it, you know you start getting into coaching and you start almost checking yourself and and finding out the more you know, the more you don't know, so to speak. So going down a pathway of how to improve what we're looking at, how we're looking at it, how we're reinforcing it, all these things, and and going off an article or two that you've written for the FA. So starting off, a a quote that that you have in one of your articles, accurate observation informs the decision-making process leading to the selection of appropriate action or intervention. In other words, what you see dictates how you act. So I wanted to start here and, and, and get your thoughts on what are some ways in which coaches fail to actually see what's going on in front of them? How is that possible? Yeah, so as you say, simple thing, observation for all coaches, something that we all profess to be good at, need to be good at in order to inform our approach and what we do. Um, but I think some of the things that we can all slip into and a lot of it comes around the more we know we want to be even more detailed and complex in our processes rather than keeping to simplicity as genius kind of model of uh, of seeing and doing. But just some, some of the things, I guess, that we can fall into from time to time is, you know, take a, a session, for example. We can get so caught up in the middle, in the heart of everything that's going on, and all we ever see then is a narrow view of what's happening within the session. So um, specific actions from within rather than getting the big picture view and taking that step back and actually seeing the big the big pitch in terms of what what's happening within the session and going uh, more big picture first in, to inform the decision making to then go smaller picture and to observe and then diagnose and then give some information around the detail so i guess from a training perspective it would be that in terms of a balance between being in there and seeing what the players see an individual player might be seeing so whether that be standing behind them, seeing it from the side, seeing it from in front, different positions that we're all taught on coach education courses, um, to then being able to stand on the outside of the session and actually see the big picture and where it fits within the wider the wider lens, if you like, of the session. So that, that would be one for me. Um, and then some of the others would be not really knowing what I'm looking for. So if I observe in a training session, maybe on a match day, stood on the touchline, and in the first half, I'm not really sure what I'm looking for. So as, as a result of that, what we tend to do then is we look for everything but see nothing. Because as we all know, the game is chaotic. There are so many actions within a single minute of a game, so, much, so many different things going on, on the ball, away from the ball, um, in possession, out of possession, that it's absolutely impossible to see everything. Um, and, and more importantly, to re- recollect everything that goes on accurately. So as a result of that, being more specific in terms of a framework for what I'm looking for and understanding what is it that I, what, that I want to see, whether that be from my team, from units, from individuals, 
Um, and then what is their role within it? So what are the roles and responsibilities of my goalkeeper? What is it in terms of the profile roles and responsibilities of my centre half, of my fullback? Uh, and then when, when you start to operate in that way, then the, the most important one for me then is to be consistent. So that from week to week, session to session, match to match, that we've got a consistent framework for what we look for and the way that we then give information off the back of what we observe, rather than going ad hoc and gung ho where every week it can change. And for, for players then it becomes difficult from a learning perspective because there's nothing really as a, as a solid foundation, as a base for consistency, which means that the terminology might change every week. You know, the language I'm using is going to change. The, my approach to how I give that information is difficult. And then it becomes harder for them to pick up on, on the cues that they need um, and the, the information in the way that they need it in order to be able to process that to inform their own performance and their own behaviours. So they would probably be my, my biggest two, really. Um, being in the session too much and not seeing the bigger picture and then not really knowing what I'm looking for and, as a result, looking for everything but seeing nothing. Does traditional coach education send us down a pathway of focusing, so say... I'm, I was taught in my coach education to focus on a certain topic. And then when you're looking at that topic, it is wrong to look at something else. You know, so if it's midfield play and a fullback steps in and you're saying, giving feedback to the fullback, that's not part of your session topic. Does that condition me then to almost take a too narrow focus in, in, in my education, in my session plan? Um, yeah, I suppose potentially it's difficult because there's so many different forms of coach education and depending on what course you're on and with which governing body or federation or whatever, sometimes that, that can vary as well. I can only speak from my own kind of experiences in there and that I think we need to see coach ed for what it is. That's an important thing for us as coaches because it's a bit like when you're learning to drive, when you pass your test, you demonstrate a level of competency but it doesn't mean you're going to be a Formula One driver. And, and that's what we need to see it as. So when we pass our coach education and we demonstrate a level of competency at whatever level that might be, one, two, three, four, D, C, B, A, whatever we want to call it, then it shows that I can coach to that level in terms of the way that I give that knowledge and, um, and, and my understanding at that level. What it doesn't do is guarantee success. Uh, and that's the difficult bit. That's the craft of learning to coach through your experiences and, and the way that you give the information. Um, but I get, I do take on board your point around focus on a specific theme, but even through a lot of my coach ed journey, and I think coach education has done a lot to try and address these kinds of things over a period of time now, really, is I've always been taught to see the detail, but also not lose sight of the big picture. And that that is tough um, because naturally the example you give there about the fallback stepping in, it's real. Um, and one of the big things that, that I often say, and, you know, through all the students and, and different coaches I've had through coach education and whatever, is try and make things look like the game. So when you develop a session, the first thing, so take it when I'm ahead of youth at, at the Welsh Premier League Academy that I've been working at more recently, when I walk out and see you coaching, one of the first things I want to know is, does it look like the game? So is there a tempo to it? The pictures, are they realistic? Are the distances realistic? Um, and does it look like football? If it does, then we've got a great start point. So wh when it comes back to your example there, where fullback might drive inside and create an overload in midfield, then I'd be saying, well, does that happen in the game? Yeah. So if it can happen in the game, then allow it, coach it, and, and work around it. Um, and rather than stop it from happening, use it as an additional option, so break in lines with the ball from a fullback, and how do I then coach the midfield players around it? Because the picture now changes. It's not the contemporary picture that, you know, I'm going to play into the deep line midfield player and then the two in advance of that, if that's what you play. I want you on the outside shoulders to go and open the middle of the pitch up so we can play through. It's changed because he's driven into the area that the, the deep line might want to get it. So it now might be that he's got to go away and somebody else comes in to offer a different angle and then it affects everyone else around them again. So, so I prefer to kind of see it that way. Um, and take what happens in it and then how it evolves. But obviously, you've got to be comfortable with what you're seeing. Again, it comes down to the observation of it um, because until you're comfortable with knowing what it could look like, should look like, and what the roles and responsibilities of your players are. So again, coming back to the profile, if you if you don't want your fullback to drive inside, then every, by every right, you know, stop it from happening. 
if that's the way that you want to model your team and that's a game model. But if you're encouraging people to travel with the ball, then you have to allow it to happen and then coach as a result of that happening rather than restrict it. Because as soon as you restrict it, then you're, you're contradicting the messages that you send. Um, and that way, the game becomes very different in what you're coaching in a training session to what might happen in the match when you're giving those mixed messages. So I think it's just being really clear on because of that, what if he drives in, what do I do now? What does each person's role become? How does it change? What's the balance of the side like? So then you work with it. Um, but it, it does take a level of comfort knowing the game and understanding exactly what you're looking for in order to allow that to happen. Because without that, you end up going very narrow, as you said, and you only focus on what it is that's on your session plan. And if it's not on your session plan, you're not allowed to do it. But then obviously you've got to understand the risk and reward of that. Um, and obviously the risk being that it doesn't look like the game and it gets far and further and further away from it. Is there a way to see how good or bad you are in the area of observation? Um, difficult one, because I don't, there's not a single measure out there. Um, specifically with football, it's probably even worse, because when you think about the, different, the various different models of, of play, philosophies, styles, whatever you want to call them, everyone's got an opinion in football and everyone will do things slightly differently. So us as coaches, then we've got to embrace that. I think if I was to encourage anything in terms of the validity of what you're seeing, one is um, to try and see things over a period of time. So a, one single snapshot of it may not necessarily be a true reflection of the norm for that player. So it, the start point is always to know your players. Um, and I guess it comes down to that, the whole process of at what point do I step in when players either make a mistake or are not really doing what I want them to. And how do you know that it was they didn't see what you want them to see? Or was it just the execution of what they were trying to do? So as an example, if I'm a deep line midfield player and what you want me to do is break lines with a pass to play forward and I don't do it the first time and I give the ball away, was it that I didn't see it or was it that I tried to do it but actually I just got it all wrong in a way that I tried to execute the pass and it was simply that? As a result, that then starts to inform how I need to intervene so I don't, if it is just the, the technique of it, the execution of it, it's very different to if I haven't seen it. If I haven't seen it, then you need to recreate it for me and help me to see the picture. But if I know the picture, don't recreate it for me because I'm going to get frustrated as a player if you're recreating the whole thing again. When I, I know it, it's just that it's come off my toe. And it was just a judgment in terms of the execution. So, so I think that, that in itself is, um, is, a, is an important consideration in terms of... Uh, exactly what it is that they're seeing or not and what is the diagnosis of it. And then the other bit is to, when you're seeing it over a period of time, if you can record sessions, and record the match footage, then validate it against the actual footage. So what I think I saw there was this. Now can I use some of the footage and was I actually seeing the right picture? Because we get a different view quite often to what the players get, especially on a match day. If we're stood on the touchline, then we're getting a very different view. We're looking from the side. So what we can see as an option may not have been an option from the position of the player. So it's important to, to see the footage again. Um, that gives you the opportunity to play it back slower and really consider it. And then the next bit is to speak with the player around the footage, potentially. They, they'll be able to tell you then what they were seeing at that specific moment, which then may explain why they did or didn't play the, the, right, the same pass or whether they didn't go and press in a certain way because they would have seen it through a different lens. And I think it's really important to consider them in it because they are the key decision makers when they're on when they're on the field. So we have to consider that. And then the other bit, as it is with anything, the more people you speak to, the more eyes you get on something, the more valid it becomes almost. So if you've got assistant coaches with you, use them. Ask them for their input. And if two or three of you think you're seeing the same thing, then there's a good chance that what you're seeing is, is, is a fairly ac accurate reflection of what's going on on the pitch. Um, if you are seeing different perspectives, then that's healthy too, because it'll help us open our minds to see different ways of and different points of view, which then will help us hopefully to drill down to get to the, to the real crux of what is it that we need to see. Um, but as with anything else, uh, and, and I'll, I'll continue to say it, it's knowing exactly what you're looking for in terms of that framework first, because without that, if you ask 50 people, you'll get 50 different opinions, probably. 
So if you've got a coaching staff of four or five, then as provided all of that, their feedback and the way they view things is through a similar framework, then you can be pretty sure that you're going to get quite a valid, incredible uh, perspective on, on what it is that's happening. So not an easy one, because there's no hard and fast. Going back to that player's perspective, that's something something I learned here. I, I deal a lot with the player's feedback uh, after games and we the system that you know you watch the game and you, you can clip and you can comment and you can try to have a little bit of interaction and we've got a japanese world cup winner here yuki nagasato and you know, for my first couple of games i thought i would inform yuki of certain decisions that she was making on the pitch thinking coach player listen this was on here this was on here she's coming back back in a coaching course that's like yes but i try to do this to this to this i'm it's two steps ahead of where i was thinking yeah. So sometimes we oversell the role of the coach and undersell the intelligence of the player. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, you know, people call it modern coaching. I see that quite a lot on social media. This bit around empowering players and providing, giving autonomy. I don't think it's modern. I think that's where learning kind of started. You know, when you look at a lot of the constructivist approaches to learning years and years and years before my time, well, they were doing it then. They were advocating it then, you know, learn to connect and, and learn from the environment. What is it from the environment that I can learn, learn from other people, the significant other, which may be the coach at the right time. So so these things have been there in, in the pedagogical literature around, around learning more generally and widely. So I think um, important one, because it's their experiences. You know, nobody's learning what you're learning. So And that's true for us as coaches in the way that we learn. But similarly, for them as players. So the way that we try and teach them needs to be through, hopefully, what the better approach for them is and the most effective approach for them is as a learner. Uh, and the only way to get to that stage is to understand where they're coming from. So opening that dialogue, understanding what is it that they were seeing at that particular time, which then helps me get a grasp for what their understanding of the game is, then the language that they use to talk about the game. And if I can connect people through using similar language to what they're using and using the examples that they give me, then the chances are in terms of that buy-in, I'm going to get far more because then now we're at the same level. Um, and I often think it's it's one where do the players have to adapt to the coach or should the coach adapt to the player? And it, for me, it's always the, fir the first um, approach should be from the coach to adapt to the player because, you know, if you talk anything around the role of the coach, power, whatever it might be in terms of shift the coach, Players hold the power because if they don't go on the pitch and perform, then you're powerless on the side. You, you can't do it for them. So make that first approach to help them. Then you'll get longer term buy-in. And then over a period of time, you can bring people and influence people a lot more around to your way of thinking, if that is what you want. Um, but similarly, the more involved they are in the process, the more motivated they'll be, the more committed they'll be towards continuing along the journey that you're on. And the chances are that that's only going to bring about extra learning and then a better level of performance in the end. I to go back there about a few minutes ago. You said about the player getting frustrated. If you, if you were talking about the technical mistake and, and they saw it, what about the coach getting frustrated and especially match day and coaching on match day and, and the coach being so competitive and seeing the game through, but now it becomes pressure, emotion. How can emotion cloud our ability to observe? Yeah, massively. And it's almost a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing, I think, for all of us as coaches, because from time to time we can all fall foul of that. Uh, we're in the heat of the moment. We almost try to become fixers. So something happens and I want to fix that situation and then I want to fix the next situation. I want to fix the next one. Well, you know, everybody, including the coach on a match day, is going to make a mistake. Every single person on that pitch, officials included. Um, no one will intend to make a mistake. No one goes out there to make a mistake, but they will. You know, whether it's as simple as going to play a ball at the line, it goes into touch. Whether it's giving a free kick away, whether it's missing a header, whatever it might be, someone's going to make a mistake somewhere. And what we have to, again, be clear on is what what are our big messages for today? What are the key things that we're going to focus on? And as a result, that I'm going to observe. And what are the things that I'm going to park? Or as one of the articles I know you read would say, I'm going to mark it for a later date. And that decision for me comes where training and match day becomes linked. 
So if on a match day I gave three key messages, for me, those three key messages should be what's happened through the week in training so that there's a consistency there again. If we say that training is to prepare people for the game in the larger sense, then use it to prepare people for the game. As a result, try and keep the approach on game day similar to or consistent with the training day so that there's a level of familiarity over what certain pictures might look like. Although obviously every game they'll change because the opposition will change and you can never perfectly recreate a situation from a game day. We can give some ideas and principles around um, and having that level of consistency with three learning outcomes or whether they go a message for the team, message for the unit, message for the individual, however coaches decide they want to do it, then use that as your framework for observation on a match day so that decide when you go in, what are the things I am going to look for and what are the things that if they happen, then I'll mark them as they go. And whenever something, whatever situation um provides itself the platform there for observing then you just go well is it within one of my three no okay but it might be important so i'll mark it for a later date now that later date may become the review of the game when you see the footage and the whole game back so that you start to build up a picture over a period of time and if you get in consistent markers week by week then it probably suggests there's something there that needs to be worked upon but if if there are some abnormal ones where there's just one one week there's something in there, then it's probably less less of a, a level of importance in terms of what, what we need to work on. So as a result, so if I just give you a real simple example, if in possession, what I'm going to look at is um, one of the key things for me around the team is opportunities to play forward from whoever. And then within that, the specific detail being around opportunities to play through. And that's what I'm really interested in. Then I focus my feedback both during the game, at half time and post game on those specific things around playing forward and playing through central areas. There's another element to it, naturally, where sometimes playing round or playing over is the best option. So within that, they may become my markers for opportunities where, because the focus was to play through, we've tried to play through too many times. As a result, now, can we start to look at this situation? This is a classic situation where the midfield units got really compact. There's no space to go through the middle. We need to go on the outside. Or I'm a centre back. I want to play through because that's what our focus is for today. But I've been pressed quite quickly. And there's a high line in the opposition in terms of where they're back for. Are. So that could have been the opportunity to go and play over first so that you pick the right one at the right time. But they become my markers. And what I really provide the detail on is how I played through. Um, because that then gives a level of consistency from training for them in terms of the types of pictures, types of scenarios they might have been faced with. And then it reinforces the learning journey. And for me, I see game day, especially through academy and youth football, as being an extension of learning. And that's their day. That's their opportunity to show us what they've learned from our training through the week. It's not another opportunity for me to stand on the touchline and profess to know everything about the game um, or try and fix everything. So if I want to do that, I might as well go and play Sabutio. Um, and if, I, if that's what I'm into and I want to move players everywhere, well, go and play Sabutio or play a computer game because that that won't bring success and it will not bring um, an effective learning environment for any player or, or for a coach for what, for what it's worth. We're just going to take a quick break here. Youth coaches, think about some of your biggest challenges. One that I frequently hear is simply the amount of time you have with your players. Have you ever finished a session only to realise that you didn't progress to the point that you had hoped to get to? That is exactly why we're excited about the work being done by Sports Lab 360, a company with a great backstory and an even better product. As a coach, you can use the platform to make assignments, focus on specific tactical principles, put in custom notes, and then track progress and scoring of your players. Coaches who have used the program report more productivity, progressions, and players not only arrive in more educated, but also with a greater desire to learn and grow on the soccer IQ side of the game. They are excited to offer MSC listeners 15% off club or team subscriptions with the code Roadshow Promo 1 or send them a note and tell them Gary sent you to get an extra week in your free trial. Sports Lab 360, please go ahead and check them out. Back to Kerry. 
you mentioned before about the coaching staff and how that framework and those different opinions can help you improve your observation and get different opinions. I wanted to get your thoughts on this one. Is there any studies to show that the more frequent the communication on a match day, the more that it may actually reduce the impact of observation? Because I think of Phil Neal and Graham Taylor and that documentary. If some, if the head coach is in your ear all the time and he's or she's nervous and telling you exactly what happens and it's a younger coach, is there any studies to show that that might actually do more damage than good? Um, maybe not so much in terms of an observation perspective, but if you look at a lot of the coach behavior literature, we'll talk about the number of interventions from a coach, whether that be instruction prior to a drill, a session, a game, whether it be concurrent, so during or post, then obviously the more you speak, the less impact what you say is going to have. So if it's someone and it's a constant voice and we I suppose when we start coaching, the easy thing to do is to commentate. And we, we see them all the time. The coach is going through the stage of commentating on everything. So it's play inside. Oh, yeah, good pass, turn, play at the line. Those types of things. No impact at all. And all it then becomes is noise for the players. So they're just used to it. Whereas if I don't speak very often, but then I stand up on the touchline and shout to somebody, they're expecting some information to come because it's not the norm for them. So I think they start to engage and they tune in far more to it because it's not the norm. Um, and it almost catches their attention because it's not something that usually happens. And I suppose in any environment you go into, if something happens that doesn't normally, it grabs your attention. So if you stood in the kitchen and some a glass falls and smashes on the floor, naturally you're going to turn to look because it's not something that you're used to as a noise. Whereas if you've got a leaking tap and you can keep hearing it dripping and dripping and dripping, you won't look every time it drips because now it just becomes a constant noise that's there in the background. So your attention isn't drawn to it. And if your attention isn't drawn to something, then you're less likely to take in the cues, whether they be verbal or nonverbal. So it may even be just the body language of the coach that's, that says everything for me. Their reaction says everything for me. Um, or it might be the word spoken. Um, but lots of literature around effective communication will say that words spoken are probably um, the least um, influential, if you like. It's it's the other factors. It's more on the body language and, and things that, that, that say the most, not the actual words itself. Um, so players don't make sense so much of the words, but they take notice of the way that they're said, the tone that they may be delivered in the message and the body language that the coach holds at that time. So I think there's stuff around that in terms of coach behaviours. There's plenty around that in terms of um, silent monitoring, needing more of it. So the silent monitoring bit, again, is the bit off task, step away, give yourself a chance to see what's going on. Um, whereas if you're always if you're always coding behaviours in the session, then it suggests that the coach is always doing something. If the coach is always doing something, then they can't be just observing what's going on. So far more around that, less so around the impact of the communication. But I guess the other thing to consider is that the more frequent the conversation, the more ingrained it becomes. And now that that can be a positive. So for us as coaching staff, especially in the early days of setting out along a route of a philosophy, a methodology, we need to ensure that everyone's clear. There's clarity from the coaching staff, but there's also clarity from the players of of what anything looks like. So if it's playing through, what does playing through look like? If it's playing round, what does playing round look like? What are the key principles? So if we need to play round, it might be that we need to go from touchline to touchline and we need good ball speed in order to move the ball quickly to look for the opportunities then to play through with the opposition now and quite recovered into a shape in time as the ball's being transferred. If it's playing over, why would we play over? What times do we play over? What does that now mean for my front players if we're going to play over? because they can't be coming to show defeat if we're looking to go in behind because of where they're, where they're shaped. So the more conversation we have over that, the more we can, we can start to build a picture. And then it comes to a point where when there's a level of understanding, it's then about refinement. And when we go through the refinement stage, it's more than, for me, about less is more. Because we have to allow them opportunity to put it into practice, to then observe and diagnose where they're at and pick out what the next bit of information needs to be. We need to know how much they understand and how much they can do. 
remembering that through the learning process, I can know something without understanding it, and I can understand something without performing it. So if I was giving an example, we we do a session on our on any phase of play, and I've got three key messages on a Tuesday night. We train again on a Thursday night. Most players will be able to tell you what those three key messages were. They may not meet, be able to explain to you what they look like in practice, so they haven't got to that stage of understanding yet. Or they may understand what it looks like in practice. So let me let me try and go through with a specific one. So it's about centre-back stepping in. So our, one of our three key messages was about centre-back stepping in. Get to the level of understanding. It may be that I can explain to you, well, when the ball gets switched from my centre-back partner, the left centre-back to me, and the striker is still over the other side of the pitch, now there's an opportunity because there's space in front of me to go and step in. So I understand the context of this is where I can do it. But at the moment, technically, I'm not comfortable with doing it, even though the space has opened up. So I've got to the stage where I know it and I understand it, but I can't perform it yet. Now my role as a coach is to go and work on your confidence in those areas of stepping in with a ball. So the practice design becomes very much around for that player, for that individual player, about going and stepping in. Technical proficiency, to be comfortable with stepping into those environments. Um, and that that's where I, I kind of see see it get built, if you like, um, over a period of time. Yeah, just just to go back there, then whenever what you're saying then is there's a big difference between having that framework initially of what you're actually working at. There's a big difference between that and and constant communication with staff and players than the the coach turning around to his assistant or the bench and saying, John or Susie's first touch is crap, isn't it? And everyone going, yeah. And it's, so it's actually, yeah. you have to be specific before, you, and, and that's where processes are important. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we need to get that broad level detail of what is our game model, what's our methodology, um, where does the methodology fit within the philosophy? Because for me, they're different. The philosophy is the overall style. The methodology is the doing. So how we bring about that style. Um, so initially, there needs to be, there will be more detail that way. Um, obviously, being mindful of not overloading with too much too too soon. So it needs to be drip fed over a process. But then it's about how do I, how can I continually reinforce the key points without saying the same things or doing the same things. So does that become an element where the players are now involved? So what we want to do is we want to reinforce the key messages around stepping in, but actually I'm going to get the centre-backs to coach each other so that now the detail is coming from them and not from me. Again, opportunity to observe because I can now watch the centre-backs when they coach each other. What kind of detail are they giving, which gives me an indication of what they understand and what's the performance as a, as a result of it. Then it may provide an opportunity for me to add something at a key time because of the detail and the conversation that they're having. Or it might be, do you know what? They did a brilliant job there. Now they're ready to get a little bit more detail around a specific situation because I've, I've been able to observe where, where they're at. Or it might be that one of the players does need that. And actually, if you consider this in addition, that will help you even more. Um, so that could be an opportunity. Other ones have been where... You potentially could get, so you get your back four, they'll present to the midfield unit what their key roles are. So this is what we need as a back four because this is, this is our game model and how we play. As a result, it would be helpful if you as midfield players did this to help us. Got it? So now we pass the messages on. Midfield players then get that and they do the same with the attacking line. So what you're now doing is joining the units on the pitch without you as a coach having to coach it and say the same things over and over and over again. And without players having to stand on the pitch with stop standstill sessions because they're getting an understanding as they go. It allows you to use your time a lot more effectively. And then obviously the, the use of video and clips that are now easily accessible with most clubs become even more powerful because there's a level of understanding of what they're looking for. Um, and where you mentioned earlier about clipping things with, with players, well, They'll, they'll buy into that. Lots of players will buy into that, clipping their own performances. From my experience, it's more about reining them in than what it is getting them to do it, as in they'll clip too much and they'll go into too many details and they'll want to clip absolutely everything. So it's about helping them understand which ones are important 
um, and which are not. So if there's something that happens three times, it's probably a little bit more important than the one, potentially. That's not to say always, because that one might be the major one that leads to a goal or conceding a goal. But um, if there's something more frequent from a learning perspective, then it probably suggests that there's more that's needed on it. Um, if it's more of a, um, a reoccurring theme within the game. So helping them with that framework, which could just be simple as your game model. So it could be in possession, play through, play around, play over. They're very, very simple principles that I think can work at grassroots level right the way to the elite even. Obviously, the, the higher the level, the more the detail will be around each one of them. But as a, as a simple premise, them. Then when we're defending, can we win the ball back? If we can't, can we stop them playing forward? If we can't stop them fo playing forward, then can we stop them playing inside? So that actually we show, show down, my philosophy is show down the line everywhere. It doesn't get confusing where, where am I showing in and where am I showing out? It's always out, always away from goal, two opportunities to defend. If it's towards goal, there's only one opportunity to defend if you do, if you allow them centrally. So it's simple as that. Can we win it? If not, can we stop them playing forward? If not, can we show outside? And then as a, as a kind of framework for players to diagnose and, and analyze their own performance, it's on those three things in possession, three things out of possession. It's quite clean. Um, and then there's a consistency through the squad. And then in terms of the way that we coach, it, it becomes a lot easier um, to go through those decision-making processes. I wanted to talk about uh, individual learning styles, something that is obviously we're, we're getting more awareness of that now as, as a coaching community, but I'm not sure we know exactly how to go about it. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how do coaches do this initially? Is there a standard testing method that you can assess each individual learning style and then when should they do it is there a best time to be doing this process before season during it pre-season get your thoughts on that um i'm not a massive fan on learning styles if i'm if i'm honest uh, i think a lot of the literature is probably debunking that now more than more than anything i do believe that we have learning preferences but i think we have learning preferences that are context specific so my preference for learning in, in an environment on the pitch might be different to off the pitch. My preferences may be to learn uh, on an individual basis rather than in a big group or on a group basis. So it's considering those types of things. Um, and in terms of understanding them or finding out, assessing who prefers to learn in what way, I think it's investment of time and and. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry for saying that because the one thing that we always say we haven't got is enough time. But some things you will not get to without investing time. And and that's one of them. I think we see more and more now with the top coaches around the world, they are moving towards a model of spending more and more time with individual players to one, get to know them. And that's not just for them, that's for the whole team, by the way. You know, whether you've got assistant coaches, goalkeeper coaches, you've got um, sports psychologists, sports scientists, the physiotherapy department, medical department, whoever it might be. But there's an opportunity there for each one of us to build relationships around the players. And the more of us that do, the more time we invest. So if there's three of us investing time in, in, in an individual player, we're probably going to learn a lot more. Um, so, so that's the first one. We have to sit down with them and understand that. And I think the, the one that probably provides the best opportunity to assess lots of this would be through match footage, sitting down with an individual player and, and looking back through the through the game and having a discussion around what they're seeing and then offering a perspective of this is what I'm seeing as, as the coach um, and this is what I think you may have been able to do. So we all of a sudden now we start to, one, we're including them. Two, the main thing for having those types of discussions and understanding how they best learn is to help them be more effective when they're on the pitch. So what better way than to use what's happening on the pitch as as the tool for doing it? Um, so from an efficiency perspective, it's, um, it's good as well. But then it allows us to judge where they're at in terms of a level of understanding, what they would call what, where they've come from before, what they're comfortable with, what they're not. Um, and, and what I also find is if you go from an individual conversation where we've discussed something around... Um, let's say wide player didn't track the run. As a result, the fullback went, created an overload in the wide area, they scored from it. If we've had that conversation on a one-to-one -one basis, 
often players are more comfortable with that then happening in a team environment than if the first occasion it happens is in a team environment where the tendency can be for the blockers to come up and resistance because actually I'm, I'm uncomfortable now. You're now picking out a fault in my performance in front of everybody else. It's public. It's a, it's worse than if we've already discussed it and I'm already comfortable with it. I know where I should have gone and now I can hold my hand up. So there's a level there as well of understanding that, that really is important. Um, and it comes down to engagement again, because if I'm put into that environment potentially, and I'm not one that likes to discuss things in public and I feel uncomfortable and easy, I'm now not engaged. If I'm not engaged, then the opportunity for me to learn and to and to perform is going to be far reduced than if I am. So I think there's a there's a really important consideration there too. But then then it's starting and, and only over a period of time. I think it would start when your relationship starts with that player, whenever that might be. So if it is the off season or pre season, great. Um, if it's not until during the season, then it's making the effort around there. But it's those small talks quite often that reveal the most. So walking onto the training field, walking away from the training field. If you're if you're a coach of a squad that travels during your travels, conversations when you're traveling, conversation in a hotel in the downtime. It's those types of things where really you can talk about the game, but less formally, and it doesn't become so pressured. Um, and as a result, you just start to pick up on individual things that specific to the to that individual person, really, in terms of what they say, how they say it, how they act in, in certain environments. And then that will allow you to be more informed. I don't, I don't ever say you find a perfect model, really, but more informed in terms of your approach for working with each individual player within your team. Because, as I said, towards the start, no, nobody's learning what you're learning and no player is learning what another player is learning. Where they're at, the way they see it, everything, it's going to be different. And that's why I'd be cautious with... Um, and I do apologise because I know that there's some people, particularly around the States, that like the learning styles. Some people I speak to quite often. Um, I do apologise for it, but at the same time, I don't because I, I see players as individuals. And that for that reason, I wouldn't want to put them in boxes of they're this type of learner, they're that type of learner, they're that type of learner. Because I think that's fluid and it can change whether it's on the pitch, off the pitch, travelling, whatever, then they change. Um, and it can change in terms of stage in my development too. So one week with pressing, I might prefer to see it on the pitch because I get it. So show me, let me do it, got it. Then it might be that I've had an experience on the weekend where I'm not so sure now and I need to actually look at the footage. So now it needs to be on a one-to-one -one level potentially with some footage off the pitch. And I, and I learned that way through seeing it there. Um, and then it may be again during the season, all you need to do is reinforce with keywords, triggers, around the press, so it might become more of an audio thing. Um, for that reason, I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable with putting a single one on anybody because I think it does vary depending on what you're learning and, and where you are in, in the stage of the season too. I wanted to get your thoughts on this then. Whenever you're talking about building those individual relationships and you said there about delivering it in a way that the barriers will come up, and this is I'm fascinated by this. Are, are, do you think we'll, we're moving away from the impact of, of the – the pre-game or the half-time, the collective team talk. Do you see any changes in that? Um, the more more people I kind of speak to in the game, I'm not I'm not that sure that there is this kind of magic wand at half-time. The more more I ask around it um, from those in the game, kind of tell me that some of the best managers they played for just reinforced the key principles. And actually what they use half time for is clarity. Because in, in the midst of the battle, quite often it becomes foggy. Uh, it becomes clouded because of what the opposition are doing, because it's chaotic, because um, we're all motivated, aroused in, in, in performance and adrenaline's flowing. So quite often it's reassuring just to get some clarity over these are the key messages. Um, so I think what we what's becoming more and more um, obvious in, in the way that coaches are taken and the approach that people are encouraging is to be clear and to keep information to a minimal at half time. So again, comes back to the earlier conversation we had around trying to fix everything. What is it? What are your three key messages? Feedback based on your three. If you're going to ask them to do something differently, there's one thing that you do differently because 
they can't change five things at half time and then go back out in 15 minutes time and, and try and implement it. It doesn't work. There's too much. Give them one thing. If they need to do something slightly differently, give them one thing and allow them to go and um, go and try it and be comfortable that as a coach, we are never going to fix everything in one go. And we're probably never, ever going to fix it because there's, I've never seen the perfect game. We all strive to play it, but I've never, ever seen a perfect game. Just like I've never, ever seen the perfect training session. There's always something that can be better. There's always something that we could change. We need to be aware of. So if we know that is the case, then be comfortable with the fact that we're not going to deliver it. Strive to, because we want to be the best we can be, but be comfortable that we can't do everything every time. Um, and there are things that need to be marked. So have your book with you, make a note of it. Um, and then, Or if you've got coaching staff with you, ask them to make a note and then they can make a note of the time and you can correlate that far easier with video so you can get specifically to them rather than have to watch all the way through the game. But mark them down as key key points to look at, but then stick to what it is at, at half time that's important. Um, but what I also see because of the way that a number of coaches are going to this one-to-one -one type session or unit type uh, footage and review and discussion is that those messages are now through the week and not on a match day. So rather than the traditional model of well, on a match day now, we'll give them this big long team talk about roles, responsibilities and everything else. They know them because it's consistent and it's happened all the way through the week. Um, and a lot, lots used to say to me, well, that's fine for a professional coach that trains every day. We don't. Well, okay. But now just change the perspective a little bit and drip feed what you can through the season. So chunk it. If it's your first six weeks of the season, what's the most important thing for you? Is it one thing in possession, one thing out of possession? Great. Focus on that in training. Focus on it on a match day. No, and, and let's be okay with this thing of my team's not going to be perfect every week. Let's be okay with that. It's not a reflection of us. It's not a reflection of the coach because the team hasn't quite performed where they want to. Particularly in youth sports, they're on a learning journey and take pride in the learning game from the start of the season to the end of the season rather than the points and the goals scored across the season. And I'm the best coach because we won these games and those games. For me, it's not about that. It's about the learning experiences. And I take a coach that has developed every player over the coach that has won every game at the, at the kind of um, detriment of the player, if you like, because all we've done is win games, but actually I'm no better now than what I was at the start of the season. So I think it's just being clear on what's important to us and why it's important. Yeah, that, that's brilliant because that's, that's how I was going to finish it with you. I was going to ask you, you know, at this time, it's the middle of June or towards the end of June, especially over here, you'll have the college coaches that are all and academy coaches that are all starting to look ahead with pre-season and put their game models all together and, and throw it probably all within the first, especially college. I did this so many years. You know, you throw everything in that two-week period, but what you're saying there is be more patient. Play the long game. I think I'd, I'd probably go, what are your three things in possession? What are your three things out of possession? And then one I like to use around decision-making is ball, space, teammate, opponent. So for every decision we make, it's in relation to where the ball is. So if I'm in possession, where am I with the ball? Where's the space? So is the space between? Is it on the outside? Is it behind? So that informs, hopefully, whether I play through round or over, so it links to the attacking principle again. Where's my teammates? So if I'm going to try and play over, is my striker high on the shoulder, a threat in the line, in their back line? Because if he's not, well, I can't really play in behind because we haven't got a chance of, of keeping or gaining possession in behind, so why would I? I'm just kicking it away. And then where's the opponents? So if I know that the opponents are coming to press high, there's lots of space in behind, I can go in there. If I know that there's space between players within their units, then I can play through. And then when I flip it, when they've got possession, where's the ball? Where's the space? So if the space is in behind me and I'm a centre-back, I now know that I need to be aware of where the wide players or the striker is because if they're high in the line and we haven't got pressure on the ball, I need to drop. If they're not high in the line, so they've dropped off and we haven't got pressure on the ball, I'm probably comfortable staying high even if the space is behind me because I know I've got yards on them in a foot race because they're not threatening the line. 
or is there space in front of me? So is there too much space between me and the midfield unit? As a result, the number 10 or the nine can drop in there or the wide players can roll inside into those space to play. If that is the case, how do I make the space smaller? So do I need to go higher and get the back four up with me to get higher? Or is it that space is down the side of me? So my right back has gone to press high up the pitch and on the centre back. All of a sudden now the danger is the channel. They can clip the ball in the channel and then there's a foot race in the channel. As a result, now I may need to change my marking position and go and stand on the other shoulder of the striker so that if the ball gets played in the channel, I can win it. And then if it comes inside, I've also got my other centre back that can recover to help me on the inside. So it's then about he manipulating my position. And I think with that principle of ball space, opponent, teammate, and the three principles in possession of play through, play round, play over, and and three maybe out of possession of can we win the ball? Can we stop playing forward? Can we stop inside? That is quite a nice, easy, basic, real basic. And some will say, oh, it's real common sense. Well, yeah, but we sometimes lose sight of that. But it provides the building blocks then where over the first two to three weeks, we can focus on them things. Then we can add to it as we go. So then it can become about the the detail of how do I play through when I'm centre of the pitch as a centre half or a deep line midfield player. What does playing through look like as a number ten where the area is congested? What does it look like as one of the wide players, as an example? Then it then it's around well playing round. What does playing round look like as a centre back? Well, I'm a part of the process, which means that ball speed is going to be really important. So I don't take 15 touches before playing out to the other centre-back. I get there quickly. So then we can focus on the detail as we build. But initially, let's understand what the principles are. Um, and that, that's that's how I would work. Not to say it's the only way, because there are so many ways in, in the game. But that, that, for me, seems a common-sense approach. And, and when I speak to people, it kind of makes sense. So if it helps, then great. Let me know. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Kerry, thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic. And no uh, appreciate all, all the work you do. And I know you've, you said eight, eight years you've been coming to the US. So I'm sure there'll be coaches that will be lined up to see you again in Baltimore. And, and we wish you the best of luck in the, in the new role. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. And uh, we'll speak again, no doubt. Thanks so much to Kerry for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. That's another one for me where it was a case of taking as many notes after the podcast as I was I was doing in the prep work before it so really really enjoyed it the, the big takeaway for me was that aspect where he was talking about spending more time with individual players in terms of more staff investing more time will allow you to learn a lot more about them and he was talking about individual learning styles and how he wasn't really a big fan of just labeling them in the learning styles but more in terms of getting to know them as individuals and when he talked about how you could have a discussion with them with the video about the game and learn to get a perspective from their side include them in their opinion and then also assess the level of understanding and I have always gone about this the other way around where you would deliver it in front of the team and then you would then check with the player afterwards and follow up with the player Whereas he is saying that you should talk to the player before you deliver to the team because when the barriers come up and the engagement level come up and sometimes we think of negative body language or we say a player is uncoachable because maybe they didn't receive the information the way we would want them to. But I think Kerry has a really powerful point there where it's we should be looking at ourselves and if we don't deliver it in the right way, then we are responsible for that message being received in the right way, the way we would want it to be. So having the individual with the conversation with the player before confronting it or before even raising it with the team, I think it's excellent advice for coaches. So I've already put that into practice this week. I had to deliver something and one or two players, I decided to talk to them about it. Wasn't, it wasn't really a negative point, but I wanted to talk to them about what I was going to deliver and get their perspective on it and then kind of assess understanding which he advises us to do so it went really really well and I learned one or two things that impacted my presentation before presenting because the players gave me one or two perspectives 
So it's something that I'm going to try and do. It's a lot more time consuming because as coaches, again, we, we try to be efficient with our time. We try to do it as a case of, right, I want to put this together, get it in front of the team. I want to deliver it. Uh, but taking a step back in the prep work and spending that 20 or 30 minutes with the two or three individuals that are going to be at the forefront of the presentation, I think is, is really, really valuable just in terms of, landing that information and making sure it gets from A to B and making sure the engagement is there and I really enjoyed that I would love to hear your thoughts as always at Gary Cornine on Twitter at Gary Cornine on Instagram I always love hearing from coaches I appreciate you listening to the podcast have a great week goodbye thank you for listening to the modern soccer coach podcast for more coaching topics sessions and resources Head on over to Coach Kerneen on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.